Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. This is the Aspen City Council work session for April 17th, 2023. I'm losing track. Uh, on our agenda this evening is a hello with the Aspen Skiing Company. And then we have some uh, board reports and uh, council updates to get to. But uh, no other pressing issues, so we'll get right into our first, uh, first topic. Hi, awesome. guys. What's up? Thanks, Tori. Oh, you're looking at it. It's springtime. It is spring. Anybody at the Highlands party yesterday? Yep. <laughs> nice. Nuts. Yeah, it was. Uh, that was a real party, for sure. <laughs> uh -huh. Woo. And it was good skiing too, um, yep. for sure. Early anyway. Uh, so yeah, down to one mountain, wrapping things up. Usually we have this meeting the beginning of the season. Uh, this one's happening at the end, um, but yeah, it's a bit of a. Uh, sort of a hello and a goodbye. So, figured we would we would do it while I was still on this side of the Dateline, um, and uh, say my goodbye and let uh, Jeff and and the rest of the crew say hello. Um, Sam, you haven't uh, been to one of these meetings before. First of all, congrats. Uh, enjoy your new position. Um, I think I think it's great. It's great to see um, you know participation uh, at the city council level and and uh, diversity of candidates and and so from my standpoint welcome um 
So we typically get together once a year and come see you guys without with a very thin packet, um, and really we're just checking in and, and making sure that the lines of communication are open uh, between the Aspen Skiing Company and and the city of Aspen. You guys are special, but not that special. We do actually go to Pickin County and Town of Snowmass Village as well, and uh, and Town of Basalt um, typically as well. So. Um, uh, again, we're, we're happy to be here, and I think this is something that Jeff will continue uh, as, as I move on, because I think uh, I found it, I think we've all found it pretty, pretty useful to just check in and make sure we're talking about what's on our minds, uh, what our priorities are, and, and um, giving each other feedback. So that's the purpose of the meeting. And um, as I said, uh, I am uh, heading out of town for, for a break and stepping down after 17 years uh, as the CEO of Aspen Skiing Company and, and 30 years with the, the company. It's crazy how time flies. Um, but the gentleman on your right there uh, is Jim Crown, and, and he's our, our managing partner. And uh, he and his family have actually uh, owned or had an ownership interest in Aspen Skiing Company uh, for more than half of our 76 years uh, in, in existence. So I think that, that you know, speaks volumes to their, their commitment to, to this place. Uh, and, and this company, and they're definitely not going anywhere. And then, obviously, as you can see, we're, we're in very good hands uh, with, with the team. Um, I want to talk a little bit about just sort of reflecting back on um, sort of the, the collaboration. I think we're really fortunate to have, I'd say, a great relationship with, uh, with our local jurisdictions and, and the city of Aspen in particular. Um, we are joined at the hip in so many ways. And uh, I think we really take a collaborative approach, uh, you know, together to really uh, get get things done. Make sure we maintain uh, our perspective on being and maintaining our position as as the best ski town on the planet. Um, and I, I look back, and there's a ton of examples, but the most recent one is obviously COVID. Uh, that was a big one. Uh, we spent uh, way more time together actually than. I would have preferred. Uh, I think we were on weekly calls, and as I said, who would have ever thunk that the, uh, the health board would become must-see TV every Thursday, uh, whatever that was. It was uh, a crazy time, but we got through it together. And, it, and as you look back on COVID, you, know, you look back at the, the positives, and one of them is, was the strengthening of the relationship uh, we have with, with you guys. So that was incredible. Uh, and then most recently, World Cup. Uh, pulling that event off, bringing it back uh, into this community, uh, a major accomplishment and not one that happens without the, the partnership uh, with, with the city and, and the entire community. And, and John will speak uh, more to that as well. And then finally, I was just looking back at the beginning of the year, and time flies, but thanks for including me in the community gathering, uh, Tori, at the, the Wheeler. Uh, that was a ton of fun, uh, and I think it was great. I think it was another example of those things is, like, let's get the local community together, step back, reflect, and remember why we're here and what's, what's so special about this place. So I was honored to participate, even if I was second or third fiddle to Pete McBride, uh, aren't we all? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was going to say. I don't it. feel bad about so, that. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, and then, you know, it, again, part of my, my reflections are uh, about the interconnectedness of things. I think Auden and Michael call it everything is everything. You just, uh, this really is uh, one community uh, interconnected uh, in, in so many ways. And uh, it's critical that we just, we stay, we maintain that perspective. Um, and as we're looking forward now in, in post-COVID, it's pretty interesting. And I think it's, uh, it's one of the challenges that you guys really have in your seats is how do you keep looking forward? And how do you take into account uh, what's happened in the past, mistakes you may have made, good decisions you made, but how do you look forward and make, make decisions uh, that are going to, uh, put us on a positive path for the next 20 years. Uh, and that's, that's hard, because it's, it's really hard to forecast uh, what, what's going to happen. Um, for instance, you know, I think it was last year, we were going, holy cow, uh, this COVID thing has really been good for skiing and maybe a little too good for this community, and we're rocking and we're packed, and what happened to off-season, and this feels like it's out of control. And, um, you know, lo and behold, you look around now, and it feels a lot like off-season. Uh, it's a real off season now, and um, you know most of the restaurants are 
are shut down. Uh, we're seeing traffic counts come down, as Sarah told us. We've met with Sarah actually in a couple weeks ago before she headed out. Um, pace of summer booking is down. Uh, last month, March was, was down uh, mm -hmm. versus prior year. So we're seeing a, a post-COVID boom return to normalcy and more, more normal behavior patterns. But it's important to remember, like, this, this February, March was pretty much the first time we've had a post-COVID normalcy, right? Because January was the return of international visitation. We didn't have any international visitation at all the prior two Januaries. December, we didn't have Omicron. Remember the year before we had Omicron. Um, and then last February, March, you just had that big rush because a lot of people had deferred their trips. They had credit from the year before when we shut down. Uh, and so you had a pretty intense February, March, and, and same with the summer, not to mention groups coming back. So, um, Mike, can I ask you a quick question ahead. there? Um, so when you when you talk about that from your from your perspective uh, and Skiko's perspective uh, being down, do you do you first reference skier days or lodging or or overall revenue? You know what is from your side of the table? What, what does down mean? Yeah, skier days and occupancy. Um, so that's mostly what we look at. It's it's harder and harder because more and more is, is Airbnb and we don't have visibility on that. Um, but we're down, I don't know if anybody has the exact numbers, a few points in occupancy uh, in March and, and skier days as well in February a little bit too. I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not singing the blues. I'm saying, look, it's, it's normalizing again. Yeah. And I think as we go forward, it's going back to more what the pre-COVID playbook was where you, you need to fill the shoulder seasons, right? Um, and you, you need to be thoughtful about bringing groups in here at the right time and the right place and, and target hitting your marketing and working a little more on customer acquisition and retention uh, and a little less on this destination management piece. You mentioned uh, the, one of the differences, short-term rental numbers and that you don't have access to that information. Um, I'd be interested to see if that information could be shared with city staff and just have the city look at it just to to start getting some some data around STR usage, exactly visitors per and stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. There are some services out there, and we we can talk about that. They're just they're not that great. We haven't found the solution that we've been we've been looking for a long time. And then second homeowner occupancy is another thing you right. know that that we don't have good visibility on. So, um, <coughs> yeah, Thanks. it is something to work on. It's it's gonna become available at some point here. I would think it's just just not there yet. Okay. I read something recently that said that um, the demand for individual rentals on STRs has decreased because, in, in the end of the article, is because the supply has increased. So there are more people out there offering, and fewer occupancy days or usage days for individuals with STRs. Yeah, I could believe that. Um, so again, I, I sort of, people, as I'm going around town said, oh, you know, 30 years, you've seen so much change. I'm like, yes and no. I mean, rumors of Aspen's demise, I think are greatly exaggerated. It is still a great place. There's so many great things about this place. Um, and you know, look, you as leaders have, have made great decisions over the years, uh, try to keep it special, uh, focus on sustainability. Um, you know, but also make sure that that economic engine is running and it, it's definitely a balance to hit. Obviously, the, the big thing uh, as we look forward is, is housing and, and we all know that. Um, but as I look back, oh, you know, Holiday House, when we redid that, I forget the year after we experienced a fire, we could have put another floor on Holiday House and um, uh, your predecessors uh, said, no, you can't put another floor on it. And, and every time I look back at that, I look at 488 Castle Creek Road, I go, ooh, they're missed opportunities. So I'd encourage you to, to lean in on density when you have those opportunities, um, take them. And I know it's tough, it's tough sitting in your seat, but uh, we've got to have density in employee housing where, where we can is my, my advice to you. Um, of course, I'll make a little bit of push for seasonal. Uh, it is the most efficient way to get, get a significant number of beds and make sure we've got enough people in here to, to keep the resort running and, and um, keep things functioning. Uh, we're just not gonna have room for uh, a house and multiple bedrooms and pets and everything for every employee that lives here. I know you guys know this, but again, I'm just gonna lean into 
uh, you know, seasonal housing, encourage you to push on that front as well. And then finally, applaud your efforts on the entrance to Aspen. I know it's early days, um, but keep the faith and keep pushing. It is time for us to, to solve that problem. So encourage you to do that. And um, I got your back anyway. Can't speak for the company anymore. So uh, <laughs> no, seriously, I think it's, uh, it's something whose time has come. So those are my, my deep thoughts. Uh, I'll stay here. But anyone have any questions before I hand it to Mr. Rigney? Uh, I've got one. I'll start with uh, uh, what did I see recently. Uh, SkiCo winter operations. 3,500 employees? 38, I think. Yeah, it's, I think we, whatever, 3,750 is, is total, but that includes the hotels. Um, yeah, right on. So, uh, uh, so 3,500 is probably about right, a little less when you, if you're talking about just the Aspen Skiing Company uh, resort operations. And then I was wondering, summer operations, do you know what that shrinks down to in summer? How many of those are that seasonal? You know, it's approximately, uh, well, it's tricky because our, our payroll run, like, next week in May is going to go down to about 600 people. Um, so it's about called 3750 600 and then I think peak, peak summer is around 1,200-ish, right in there. Awesome. Don't, Thank you. Know, those are rough numbers, but so No, I appreciate it. Just context. <laughs> yeah, I'm... The seasonal housing thing, looking for partnerships on that, and I know MAA has decreased the size of their, their school and the, the length of time, but um, I'm always looking for partnerships. And um, I, I prefer year-round housing, but I know that there's demand for seasonal housing, and I invite the ski code to, to uh, approach the city for any kind of partnership uh, opportunities. Yeah, thank you. For sure, that's... We're talking. Um, we're definitely talking and about different ideas and, and excited about what you guys are doing and um, looking into other opportunities as well. Corey, I have a question, if, if yep. you can hear me. Thanks, Bill. Go right ahead. Uh, thanks, Tori. Uh, Mike, congratulations on an incredible tenure at SkiCo. I know you've done an amazing job with the company and, and for the community. We appreciate it. Uh, my question, and I don't know if you have plans to cover this, but curious if you have any new employee housing properties or projects in the pipeline anywhere in the Valley. Um, <clears throat> we are working on the pipeline. We don't have anything that's, that's ready to be brought forward for development, uh, but we are continuing to add units into um, the Aspen Basalt Campground or the Tiny Home Campground. Uh, we added about, call it 40 beds um, this this winter, uh, and we have another, uh, another well, another 50 or so to go for this summer. Um, so that's short term, and then longer term, we're looking at several different things um, that are in the hopper. Nothing ready to, to announce yet, but uh, we have Philip Jeffries, who many of you probably know, is pretty much just does employee housing development. That That's all he does, and then obviously Michael Miracle helps him a lot and, and others, and so Philip's, he's working hard, and you know, we'll, we'll keep putting stuff forward. Mike, I'm curious. It's I don't know how many years it's been now with the tiny homes. I'm thinking three, but it's probably longer. But how those have worked out, those are three beds each, right? Yeah, I mean, they've evolved. Um, they were three beds each. Now they're four. Um, but they each have their own bedroom, and you can um, – and, and no longer is there a loft, so we've sort of reconfigured them. You should go down and do a tour. Go, go check them out. Um, they're working great. I rode the lift today with one of our uh, employees, a tuner, who's, you know, lived there all winter and, and loved it, you know. So it's a great sort of transitional seasonal housing thing where first couple years it's great. It starts to get a little small after a, a little while. Philip Jeffries, if you're listening, I want a tour. <laughs> uh, Bill, did you have any, any other questions? Good at the moment. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Sam, anything? I'm good. John, any further? No, nothing, thanks. <clears throat> Hand it to Mr. Rigney. Right on. Come on, just lock it up. All right, gang, um, thank you very much. Uh, I know a number of you. I've met a couple today, uh, perhaps that I didn't, and Bill, I'm sure our paths will cross. Uh, but John Rigney, I've been with the company, uh, for, this is my 34th season, and Mike likes to remind me that 
the first four word Highlands. There's a little bit of an asterisk there from this guy, but <laughs> if you look around at Highlands yesterday, I think everybody would applaud that. Um, anyway, I, uh, I oversee our revenue centers, uh, but a lot of times I'm known for kind of my work. I, I've been on the chamber board for a long time, you know, in and throughout the community as a volunteer, and then um, I've been running our events department for uh, 20 some odd years. So I thought I would maybe just start with something that's uh, fresh in the memories um, and World Cup, right? It was an amazing weekend. I honestly think, and you guys could vote on this, it's one of the very few uni universally applauded things in this town. And I would say that the mood meter goes through the roof when we host World Cup, and especially of late, right? Because it's not a given and we know it. So 2017 was one of the most, you know, tight-knit community weekends I've ever seen in my life. Um, I thought the Saturday of this weekend was amazing. Uh, Ward, I saw you at the base of the course on Saturday. Tori, you volunteered throughout the weekend. And John, I think the quote is, this is my favorite week of the year, and that includes vacations. <laughs> so yeah, I, wildly powerful. He was manning the ship at the base of Ruthie's, right at the bottom of Aztec. And, uh, and he was needed, and conveniently, he wanted to be there, which I think says a lot about kind of World Cup. So we owe a great debt of thanks um, to the city and a lot of people for helping us pull, pull off World Cup. But I want to circle back to that. That's how I'm going to conclude. But uh, whether it be the park, um, whether it be the opening ceremonies, we, we, the whole town came out. We had a lot of people in town. We were pretty much booked. And a lot of folks made the regional jaunt to be, play a big part of it. But I thought it'd be a good jumping off point to talk about why we host events, right? The, 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 the excitement around events kind of ebbs and flows with, uh, uh, through the years. But we've kind of stayed true to a number of reasons, somewhere between seven and nine, of why we host events. Uh, and it's been pretty steady for you know, going on 20 some odd years. And so I thought I would kind of bounce through that real quick. And again, happy to do questions at the end. But some of the bigger events that you're seeing right here on the screen, they check a lot of the boxes. So if we do 10 reasons, five or six of them are embedded right inside of this, uh, including these bigger events, a great opportunity to gather and influence influencers, right? Tell the Aspen Snowmass story through a first person lens, whether you're an athlete, team manager, videographer, photographer, journalist, is very powerful, right? Um, and, and, I, and I think we've succeeded in that, right? When people come to town, they come back. It's, it's, it's pretty obvious. It's a good opportunity to reinforce the brand. Uh, you know, I can make an argument that our events are <laughs> some of the most, some of the greatest living embodiment of our brand, and it comes to life, I don't know, 75 days a year, every year, which is pretty impressive. There is an advertising or a marketing element that comes when you do an event like X Games or World Cup, World Cup which is up on the screen. I mean. World Cup gets beamed out to 100 million homes worldwide. Um, they're not all watching it, but it also, it, it keeps us up on that mantle of very few places get to do events of this caliber. Um, cannot do these events without collaborating across the board <coughs> with the entire community. Um, and I believe, you know, we always go to city, county, town of Summers Village, but don't forget, you know, we work with RAFTA, um, AVH, the school district, you name it, we're involved with pretty much every, uh, you know, sizable business in the Valley when we pull off these things. And then there's the element of leadership, right? Um, you know, nobody does X Games. Very few people do World Cup. Nobody does both. And then some of the other things I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on. Um, but one of the biggest things we do is we love to celebrate athletic achievement. And what you're looking up on the screen is the highest level. But we do it in the sports that we love here as locals, right? Um, you know, we've invested in mountain biking. It's a big part of our spring, summer, and fall life, right? We try to bring that to life in events. <clears throat> Uphilling, tie hack on a Saturday, you can see 400 of your best friends all walking up the hill. Uh, we do the biggest schemo event in North America. Uh, the snowboarders come out, slash the mass is sold out every year. We use the open to take advantage of the courses that we build for X Games. And as a matter of fact, we then work with the club, and they're running gates in the middle of the pipe in July. So we try to take advantage of these things because it's, it's what we love, it's what we do. Um, 
you know, but we also do it for youngsters. You know, we'll do a free boot camp two weekends a year just to teach kids how to ride a rail that's an inch off the ground, which probably is good for someone like me too. When or is a that? jump. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Last weekend in March. Hey, okay. Come on out. You get good instruction. Um, anyway, see, these are some of the other ones where we also celebrate athletic achievement, young, old, every discipline we can think of, even those that we don't involved with all the time. Part of what we're doing is um, adding value to the resort experience, right? When people come to town, yes, they would like the skiing and the riding to be fantastic if they're here in the winter, but it is so much more than that. So whether that's luminescence, which was born in Snowmass as a way to engage people during COVID where we couldn't gather, um, or games, participatory games for families, people of all ages, our concerts, so th that's a shot from Saturday uh, at the base of Elk Camp. I don't, did anyone make it out? Oh. It was great. It was great. Um, cold water. It was cold water. It actually froze the night before, so we had to <laughs> send some. I did not go in. No, no, no. Um, another reason we do events is um, generating trial for the resort, right? So top left corner, you've got some of the most passionate skiers in the world and mainly in the Midwest, where they are racing on ice at night in Minnesota or Michigan, and they come here to celebrate their placement in the NASTAR Nationals. We had 496 competitors two weeks ago out in Snowmass. We've been doing this off and on for about 18 years. Um, great way to show off the sport to the already converted. Um, a lot of events were really built towards, you know, forever. We're probably on the higher end of the demographic uh, spectrum. And, you know, my job through a lot of this programming is to aim younger. We want to feed the pipeline the next generation of Aspen lovers. You know, X Games, without question, checks that box. But we also do events that celebrate groups that come to town. Bottom left, Gay Ski Week, we've been doing it for decades. It's one of the most anticipated weekends of the year. Uh, and then just last week, we hosted Burton's Culture Shifters, which I think Auden might talk about a little bit. But this is, you know, bringing uh, a significant number of folks from sport, uh, from, it's really headed up by Burton, and they came to town and they took over the limelight, African Americans, people of color, all out, many of whom have never been on snow before. So it's this idea of building the pipeline, like all business is not great business, right? We don't need another percentage of occupancy during President's Week or um, the holidays, but you know what? First week of December, first week, second week of April, that's, that's great. The week after X Games, that's a good opportunity to bring groups into town and celebrate them, make them feel like they're a part of it. We also pride ourselves on being builders of community. You do it in what you do, but there's less and less of it in the world around us and in this valley than ever before. And most everything we do is free and open to all from an event standpoint. So whether that's celebrating the biggest ski and snowboard club in North America, ABSC, and their biggest fundraiser, Ajax Cup, we do it on the busiest day of the year on Aspen Mountain because it's the right thing to do to support these kids. Town concerts, you know, we are lucky to work with you guys to do street shows. They're fantastic, whether it be fireworks. When people come to town and there's just something, you know, that, that draws density and you're looking back to the folks that you moved here, you used to work with, that are members of your constituent, all this comes to life in a lot of the program that we bring forward. And then I would say, um, well, I missed a couple things. We also gather, you know, last spring, last winter, we gathered to send off our Olympians and then to welcome them back. We gathered to celebrate the Aspen High School undefeated state champion basketball team, uh, the golf team, state champs, the dance team, right? We do that with you because it's the right thing to do and it's our community. But our events kind of give birth to some of these things that are fun. It could be class's 100th birthday. We may be planning 105th or 120th for all I know, right? But we try to bring it on the hill and make a big deal of it. And then I'd say, I'd close, I had referenced it, I wanted to come back. World Cup was great. And the racing was the center of the photo. But at the end of the day, there's nothing here that isn't better when we work together. So those signs on Main Street, they're super cool. We had to basically pay defense and try to avoid getting them ripped off all week. 
but it just signals to everyone driving down Main Street, we're all together. We did the grand opening out in Snowmass. That's the first. Most of the athletes were in Snowmass, and Snowmass Tourism jumped all over it. They helped bring it to life. So a lot of people deserve kudos, the lodging community for sure, but you've got a ton of people, Diane, that work you know, for you, and they're probably not used to this being part of their every day, but that park we populated because it was our community. The streets we needed because we, we had, that was a cost of doing business to bring these people to town. So their work, their ability to roll up their sleeves and stand side by side with us as kind of we try to put Aspen in the best light to the world is deeply appreciated. You guys help fund us. That's another way you might know me. I come once every couple of years and ask for a few bucks. But that's a big deal and that's what helps create that community programming. So. I'm good on my end on the event stuff, but if any of you, uh, Bill, have questions on that, I'm happy to answer. Thanks, John. Uh, <clears throat> I'll start it off. Um, first of all, I, uh, this is a great year. It was a great year. You know, whether it was just uh, all of us coming out of the haze from pandemic or not, um, it was just awesome. The energy was fantastic. Obviously, World Cup it does add a lot to that. But I think it was every day. So many great skiing days that were up there. Um, I think uh, the service level on the hill was maintained. You know, you did a great job of of not letting that drop. And so I think a lot of things factored in. But the energy and the feeling in Aspen is really, uh, really high right now. It's really wonderful. Um, two things I would say. One, uh, last night ESPN was playing a uh, rerun of some of the X Games from Aspen. So when you talk about the impact and the marketing and the outreach and branding for us, uh, it goes on from that event on and on and on, which was very neat to see. Um, you know, there's always such that pride when I see the name Aspen up on the, you know, the guide for, for what's going on. It's like, that's not just here in our valley. That's everywhere that that's playing. Uh, I had a question for you about the Bud Light relationship, the Bud Light concert series, uh, Bud Light Hi-Fi concert mm -hmm. series, I think it's called. Um, are you in a contract with them or, or is this like a annual thing that happens? And the reason I'm asking is just about, um, you know, coordinating, um, you know, and the synergy between the city and the ski code and what we want to do together. That's one of the areas of overlap because we love that. And like you said, a lot of times we host it in the street, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just wondering, uh, it, <coughs> Do you, do you have the next year already mapped out with them? Is it an annual thing? Does it come up when it comes up? Or how, how does that relationship work? They've been long time, long time partners. Um, kind of the three um, legs of the stool are music, um, spring programming, and then we do like participatory um, uh, programming in and throughout Snowmass Village. So we are in a multi-year deal. Uh, we've been with them a very long time. And we basically know what we're doing. We're dropping programming into dates, you know, with a big fat asterisk next to it. But we're not booking bands now for next year. We'll do that, you know, as we start to solidify which events, where, where can we generate the most, you know, kind of uh, support. Um, and then we'll nail down the more precise details. Why, is there something specifically? No, not really, just just really in that spirit of where we overlap, where we cooperate. And, you know, it, it's been an initiative from the previous council about interactive community art and music events. We want community gathering. We want to bring our community together. And this is one of the ways that we do it. And it's one of a lot of people's favorite ways. Yep. So I'm really just asking you based on, you know, hey, uh, number one, I want to make sure that that works into our calendar our community calendar yes. really well for both of us. Um, but beyond that, just to, to uh, continue to look for and, and you know continue to let you know that the city uh, is just so interested in partnering. You know, <coughs> I, I'll say this. I, I think that the ski company and the city and the community are in one of the best places that we've been as c collaborators and partnerships uh, that I've seen. I I've only been here 30 years, so I can only go back that far. Um, but like, honestly, and I hope, my, you know, uh, Mike, I hope you feel really great about that because a lot of it's been, you know, from your leadership, but 
Uh, anyway, I just say in the sense of I just want coordination. I want us to all be working together. Um, I want us to move together as much as we can, us to support the Aspen Skiing Company and the entity it is, but the Aspen Skiing Company to also be supportive of the community and, the, and, and Aspen and what, what, what we are trying to do and the messaging that we're trying to get out as well. So that's all. Totally get it. Very much appreciate it. And, you know, night skiing, that was last year when we were coming out of that fog that you referenced, right? They came out in droves. We couldn't even keep up with the demand. And they were in line at the base of the mountain for, you know, 40 minutes. But everyone loved it. So music's a, a good uh, gathering aspect. We'll continue to walk hand in hand with you guys. Yeah, appreciate it. Ward? Yeah, thanks. Um, is the Power of Four, that's the largest schemo event, in, is that the one you were referencing? Yes, sir. That's awesome. Um, as far as uh, Wagner Park, a.k.a. Uh, Wagner Rugby Stadium, uh, we've been, over the years had um, some pushback from community members on usage of Wagner Park, but never a peep when it comes to the World Cup. It's like, duh. <laughs> Everybody loves it, and I, I couldn't. I have memories going back. Uh, when Stenmark and the Mayor Brothers were and we'd shut down Sabatini's and hike up the hill and watch the practice runs. It was, it was, uh, there, there are people now that don't remember or don't know who Stenmark was, uh, is. Uh, so it's a whole generational thing and it's such a wonderful thing to have the World Cup back and it, it brings to mind the, the question about FIS and Lift One. Um, where are we with that? Are we, are we still, <laughs> Still in line for events? I believe so. Um, you know, Lift One is its own entity. When that comes to life and, the, you know, the, we get go in the ground, we got to figure out what we can or can't do. But keep in mind, we've got race venues throughout, you know, the venue. I would say that we did a good job um, given very little notice to pull off a springtime speed event and we remain in dialogue with these folks. I believe the tour would like to be here and in other locations in North America, and I think Aspen has made it clear as could be, like, we love it. It's part of our, 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 our soul. It's, it, it brings people out something from within. So, Ward, we are, we're working on it constantly. Um, I feel good about what we just uh, put down, but we know that we could do better if we're given a little more time. We'd like to be part of a, a, you know, some continuity of concert or of, um, you know, some cadence because you've got to build a team and you've got to have that institutional knowledge that we use this garage to park cars and that garage to tune skis and this park to do that and this to do the other thing. We lost all that over six years. And we had to really like remind folks like, hey, if you weren't here, let me tell you a story about the history of World Cup in Aspen, which runs deep. So I would say, knock on wood, I feel good about the direction we're going. Most of this stuff won't get crystallized <coughs> until June 1. And then we'll know our fate and hopefully it's something with a little bit of teeth to it and some regularity, but that's what we're hoping for. Well, I have open irons for uh, World Cup events in the future. Thank you. Great. We go to Bill. Thanks, Tori, and uh, thank you guys for the incredible events. I know you go above and beyond for our community and for our guests and uh, couldn't be prouder of the work that you do and the risks that you take and the creativity that you employ. Uh, what I wanted to ask was, what could the city government do to make your job easier and more successful? What could we do better? Or what could the government do better? You know... I'd flip it first. The longer lead time we have, we can make, it, it, it'll be easier for you to help us with everything. Um, I would say, I, I kind of, I draw a parallel internally. Like we run four mountains and they are each their own entity. They have their own style and flavor. We've got continuity across the four mountains. But at the end of the day, we used to feel like we were, you know, a semi-invited guest when we would do events on these mountains. We're basically an entity without a home. So we worked long and hard to educate our own crews. Like, look, events is part of our being. It's part of our brand. We don't want to feel like we're begging when we come to town and feel like we're putting you out. Of course, we want to take care of the guests and the people that put in the work day in and day out, 150 days in a row. But 
I could draw a parallel. Like, if we're going to get back into doing, I mean, we've been doing X Games for 22 straight years, right? The county gets it. It's not accepted begrudgingly. Like, RAFTA gets it. Do they want to do this that week? Probably not. But they do it because for the good of the community. So I would say, Bill, letting the broader team know, like, hey, we're doing this in concert with ASC or whomever else. Th that's that's a dialogue changer. That makes people sit on the same side of the table and look at all the problems as opposed to make it look like it's a give and take and you didn't do this or you haven't done this or we didn't need to know more. We're on the same squad and we don't control everything. We control on hill and we try to contribute off hill. So does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I, th I think so. Uh, to put it in other words, it, you don't feel welcome uh, okay. to interact or as welcome as, as you could to interact with the government in the services and the and the permits that you need to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. Is I would correct? not say that. I honestly, I would say I'd echo your comments, Tori. We're in as good a spot as we've ever been. We try to give a clear understanding of what we're setting out to do, and then we we rally around it. No, no, no. I just say over time, the more uh, that we understand that we're in this together, and it is we're basically co-oping a major international event, um, the smoother things will be because this year was tough. We got very, we had eight months lead time. It, it was difficult. So, uh, you know, I apologize for that which uh, couldn't have been done smoother or faster or sleeker, but we're also respect, respectful of the community we're in. And um, no, I, I, I just think with time and with planning breeds, you know, greater success. I was uh, so so am, am I to, understand that it's more of an attitude thing or it's more of a process thing? You know, I, I would just add, Bill, I think it's one of those where uh, in your roles as basically a board, uh, be really helpful if you, you send that strong str strategic messaging to your staff that these are important, uh, these are critical for this community building we've been talking about, and we want you to, to work closely in collaborating with, with the ski company and make sure these events are, are the best they can be and then get out of the way. Thanks. That, that's sort of what I Thanks. did, I think, a little bit, right? The, yeah. he, he's referring to maybe some, anyway, these events are hard to pull off, right? And so we have this internal tension as well, like, oh my God, I got a, you know, I got a groom, I got this, I got that, and now you're gonna put this event on top of me? I mean, and everybody's working hard and doing good things, so helpful to get that messaging from, you know, senior management, or me sometimes is just say, you know, this is important. We want to celebrate achievement. We want to gather community. We want to get our brand out there. This is why it's important. So um, please lean in and, and thanks very much. And to a man and Thank woman, you. everybody was great to work with. They were. I mean, Sarah, Nancy, teams, they've been, they've been wonderful. But hopefully this isn't a one-off and then we can just build on what we've learned this year. Thanks. John? Yeah, I just want to say... Um, with a gap of six years, and I know there, there were some hiccups at the beginning of the week, weather didn't help. Uh, you guys did a great job of getting it together and pulling it off, and the races were happy, the community was happy, and it was an awesome weekend. So, great job, thanks. Yeah. Uh, a repeat of this winter would be wonderful. All the events were just incredible. The snow was incredible. The World Cup was an amazing event to be at. Um, I know this is not uh, new, but Solemn and GS would be cool at the World Cup. Uh, women would be cool at the World Cup. I know just like a rotating schedule, especially if we did it like every year, because I'd love to see it here every year. And then the other thing I would add is uh, one thing that I think has gone by the wayside that would be cool to come back is a ski patroller's ball. I know they used to do that, and I know I've heard clamoring for that to come back because I heard that was a wonderful party as well. All right, noted on all fronts. When we suggest things to patrollers, they usually immediately put it in the no camp. So <laughs> I'm thinking, I've heard I, it from I, I'm thinking about how so. I seed this, but um, oh, it's interesting. All right. Hey, we love. We hosted women. Uh, I want to say for about 14 years straight, mm -hmm. and tech. I think our big learning in 2017 was to see the race course alive top to bottom, to see the park filled with people, to take the blinders off the televisions that were panning only the race course in November. We didn't, we'll do it if we have to, if it's part of something bigger. But we want in, we want in on a regular basis, and we think it should be shown off in its glory in February or March. Love that.
I think it was awesome that uh, when you zoom out on the cameras, there was white instead of just the white ribbon on green oh, yeah. as in Europe. No restrictions on the cameras this year. <laughs> and X Games was one three-day snow infomercial. That was incredible. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. So that white ribbon issue is partly why the World Cup wants to be in Aspen, because it's hard to do it in Europe. Um, you know, John conscripted me, his team conscripted me into gate tending for NASTAR a few years ago. And I watched people come down and they would have these horrific windmilling crashes. And I was like, this is a rough, these are amateurs. And then some dude went down, it did pretty well. And I was like, well, that guy was pretty good. And I, I found out later that it was Ted Ligeti. <laughs> That's Aspen Basically. for you. You could do GS. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, you know, our approach to sustainability, which includes community, it cl includes diversity and justice, and, and Michael and Hannah Berman are key parts of this work, is Aspen's approach. And if you had to distill it simply, it's we model solutions for the world right here because of who we are at Aspen. And the city's been doing this for years around housing and transportation and so forth. And then we wield power. We use the access we have, the media attention, the influence, the partnerships to drive big scale systemic change. And then the last thing we do, and people often do this for us, is we talk about it. We get it in the media, we get covered, so that the ideas, good and bad, successes and failures, spread. Um, I'm gonna talk about a few of these things, but you know, it's important to say that you, City of Aspen, has always seen itself as an agent for change in the world, a, a part of building the good society. Pepke strongly believed that. That's how we see our business. We see our business as a tool for positive change in the world. And that's gonna continue. Uh, and some of the things I'm gonna show you are really cool and really exciting, especially for the nerdier, wonkier of you. I'm not calling anyone out by name, but, but many of you here are. So this picture is the hub. It's uh, employee housing and basalt on a transit line. It's 100% electric. It's a model for how you decarbonize the built environment. The whole roof is covered in solar panels, but also heat pumps. These are the heat pumps that don't work in cold climates, according to the bad people. They do. This is, this is showing heat pumps work in cold climates. By the way, if you go up to the Wapiti Wildlife Center, 12,000 feet on snow mass, we retrofitted it with a heat pump to show that it works. It's a Mitsubishi. Um, and one of the things we're going to do on Hub and at the Wapiti is we're going to put signs up. And we're going to, so that every guest, and we have hundreds of thousands of guests, learns about this. And they can link to more info. And the fact that we did this too helped train up contractors in how to do it. This, this building did not work perfectly initially and it's something that the community and, and, and you all are thinking about is how do you train people to do this so that we have the workforce. The green building now called the Skier Services Center at Snowmass, this was the grand opening. Th this, we've built a bunch of buildings and we've always worked on, on green and we've done some well and some not so well. This is as good as we could ever do. And I'll just point out a, a few features of it. Um, so it's all electric and basically everything we do now is all electric. You understand that if, if a building is heated with natural gas, it emits CO2 for its lifetime. If it's electric, it gets cleaner as the grid gets cleaner. So this building is all electric, but it's also got some awesome features that only the super wonky building people would appreciate. First, the codes in Picking County are excellent. Just meeting them gets you a good building. This building beat code in the walls, our 28 walls, our 60 roof. So amazing insulation. But then if you look at this picture, what you see the green um, outside is continuous uh, mineral wool insulation all the way around the building. That means there's no thermal bridging through studs, which is what you see when you look at a barn in the snow and you see lines of heat coming out. This is a, a critical design technique. And then if you look at the, the picture with the ladder in it, 
we did spray foam interior insulation on the exterior walls. That spray foam is, is airtight and it's very high R value. So you've got that on the inside and then you have this rigid continuous insulation on the outside. It's awesome. And then the windows, all the windows in the building are double pane argon gas filled, super insulated windows. They have a R value that exceeds four. A lot of the buildings around here, at best you're getting two and in many cases you're getting one for the window. So it is an amazing building and we're gonna put, I'm working on this now, this is where my job gets mundane, a sign so that all the guests who come by get educated on how this building was built and they can go back to their communities and show them. You know, Tori, you were talking about partnerships and we wanna do stuff. Uh, we've been hosting a series called Aspen U for Aspen University for years at Limelight. The vision was let's educate our employees who wanna be involved in sustainability, let's educate the community. And this year we started uh, partnering with ACES. ACES doesn't have to do anything but help us market it and occasionally they kick in a little money. The, but there's no harm to the partnership, it helps pack the room. This talk we did was about fossil fuel subsidies uh, in the world and particularly in the United States. It seemed to me like the kind of topic that no one would show up to. 65 people packed that room. There was back and forth, it was incredibly lively, it was fun, and so we're more than happy to, in the future, say, hey Aspen, you're a partner too, we'll put your name on it, you help us market it. Occasionally there's some costs associated with speakers, but they're teeny because I'm incredibly cheap and I run it. So this is another example of community gathering, collaboration, and partnerships. This guy we brought in, by the way, Doug Coplo, he was the world expert on fossil fuel subsidies, awesome. And he got to ski while I was here. That's why I came. So the other thing we've thought about over time is how do you drive the biggest level change possible? And we worked for a decade with Protect Our Winners to help build the organization. When we started working with them, they were uh, a budget of $150,000. Their budget's $7 million now. Wow. And in the Inflation Reduction Act, they went to, they sought out the head of Snowshoe Ski Resort in West Virginia to get that CEO to go after Joe Manchin, the swing vote on the biggest climate bill in the history of the world. And they did. They got a hand-delivered letter to, from the CEO to Joe Manchin. It was more of the pressure that he experienced to flip his vote. So did they win that election? Did they pass that legislation? No. But that's how the industry can wield power in ways that it hasn't historically wielded power. And whenever we do something, we're thinking about how to have bigger influence. So when World Cup came to town, working again with Protect Our Winners, we hosted a panel in a blinding snowstorm. This was, when I arrived, I was like, where's the uh, canopy? And they're like, there's no canopy. <laughs> and your microphone was piling up with snow. And, uh, but, but look at who's on the panel. It was Travis Ganong in his last season as a World Cup racer. It's Sophie Goldschmidt, the head of the US ski team that historically has always thought about climate in terms of, oh, we'll tweak little things. She's looking at how do we wield power and do systems change. And then next to her is Daniel Wiesland, the CEO of Audi North America, uh, who was one of only a couple CEOs in the country to write an op-ed with Mike Kaplan for Newsweek in support of the climate legislation. Think about that. CEOs generally aren't writing letters in support of climate action. And you're sitting with one, you're sitting with a future one here, uh, old one there, future one here, and, uh, and the head of Audi's all in on this. So super cool, super impressive. You know, we're also thinking about big, big issues like justice for the African American community in the US. Burton Culture sh Shifters is amazing. First off, Burton is as good a company in terms of sustainability and justice as Patagonia or as we aspire to be. They've worked, they were instrumental in building Protect Our Winners as well through Donna Carpenter, one of their founders who was up here. This group keeps growing, it keeps expanding. If you visit it, I was at um, the Limelight talking to some folks and one guy next to me was a ex-NFL football player. And the, the, they're all members of the 
uh, of diverse communities, many uh, African Americans, and some who have never skied. And you can see Michael wanted me to have this quote uh, here. This is what Burton said about us. Aspen's own DEI initiative means that their value as a partner extends beyond their commitment of lift tickets, food and beverage, on-hill support, and snow operations. And if you talk to these guys, they, they want to be here. They're coming back. And as John said, this is a end of uh, beginning to mid-April event when the town's empty. We've got the capacity, so it provides jobs. It's a perfect time to bring them in and treat them well. Oop, I think I'm done. Any questions for on? I have one if nobody else does. <clears throat> yeah, go right ahead, Bill. Thanks. Uh, Auden, I would be interested in, uh, and we don't have to talk about this during this meeting, but interested in, in you, you and Skiko sharing your experience about composting. I know you do an incredible job with composting and sort of the lessons that you've learned as this council has passed recent requirements for the city of Aspen's restaurants to compost, you know, how, how do we do it successfully or how do, how do restaurants do it successfully? Uh, how do we make sure that the compost stream is not soiled? Um, and this is not a self-defeating effort. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm happy to talk at greater length, but you know, we were early on the compost train. Uh, we've toured the, the landfill facility multiple times. It's working, it's a model for the world. It's more important than recycling because uh, if you don't compost, you have methane coming out of the landfill. And uh, it's also difficult like everything in business. But one, one measure of success and one approach that's worked for us is get rid of as much non-compostable stuff as you can so that most stuff goes in compost. And we're actually finding that our recycling stream is so contaminated that we're, we're looking closely at how do we just get rid of the stuff so we don't have, you know, why, one question I'm asking now is why do you have a plastic bottle of Powerade <coughs> and got a fountain that serves Powerade? Let's get rid of it. But composting is, is amazing, critically important, and we're doing it better than anywhere here in this municipality. Anything else, Bill? No, thank you so much. Ward. Our house is about 40 years old, and uh, this winter we got rid of our electric baseboard and put a Mitsubishi mini split in, and it's the first time in since we moved in in 82 that we've actually been warm and our um, <laughs> energy usage has gone down. So. Um, the new Mitsubishi's at elevation and in cold weather, um, great stuff. Ward, uh, you're also getting older and colder. But, oh. but you know, mo going from baseboard to heat pump is a good uh, move financially. It's harder to get a house from natural gas to heat pump, and uh, that's a separate conversation we can have. I am certain I'm, I've rotated off the core board, but I'm certain that core is more than willing to have that discussion. And I know that uh, training for installers is something that uh, is on the radar of core as well. Yep, and we're talking to them about that. Thanks, Ward. John? Yeah, I'll, I'll save it for offline. Thanks. Okay. Anything? Uh, is there anything the city could be doing better sustainability-wise, partnering with SKECO on sustainability efforts? Anything you'd like to see differently here regarding sustainability? Thank you. And thank yeah. you all for repeatedly asking that question. That's changing the public's view of government. Uh, you know, there, there's these large problematic issues that, uh, that Michael behind me is a specialist in. Uh, Short-term rental expansion means you have more you built your community is evolving around single car use instead of mass transit. So we're interested in those questions. Mass transit improvement, housing, uh, density, deed restricted housing, how the air, I'm on the airport advisory committee, how's the airport going to interface with other things? We're working on an ambitious, um, at this point, theoretical effort to try to, to conscript core and, and help fund them maybe think about planning differently. 
So all these things are, we're natural partners. And, and, you know, it really, we do say everything is everything. All these issues are the same thing. Housing is climate. Housing is composting. Transportation is climate. It's also customer service. And so this is, you know, the, the, the thing I like about what we are and who we are is we can model these solutions for the world. It's going to require us to work together um, and make mistakes, but we will. And, and this is such a great group of collaborators that we should just make sure we're in, in close contact as possible. Auden, what about the electrification discussion we had with some of the folks here? Uh, electrification. Banks, uh, automotive. Oh, uh, vehicles? Yeah. Oh, oh charger, charging stations. So just quickly, an, another example. So Audi's pushing on electric vehicles. And uh, this is, uh, I finally understand what John was talking to me about. We need, if you see what's happening in the electric vehicle fleet, it's far exceeding chargers. And, and if you've noticed that a lot of the charge point chargers don't work, uh, we put a lot of those in, and I'm making a call tomorrow to try to push that forward, like let's get those fixed. But we're going to need more chargers and more fast chargers, or you're going to end up with uh, a lot of EVs and nowhere to charge them. So the, a partner of Audi is Electrify America. We talked to them about putting a fast charger station in Aspen. That didn't work. But this is something the city of Aspen should do, and Electrify America wants to do it in Aspen to have a, hey, here's a gas station. It's six fast charger stations. It's at the parking garage or wherever it makes sense, and Aspen leads on that. So this is really important. Um, I installed a couple of EV stations at Skiko like eight years ago, and everyone was like, well, no, I can't park there. And now we're overwhelmed with electric vehicles. So this is, this is something we definitely want to get ahead of as a community. Thanks, Ed. And I think Aspen is the first municipality to have an EV mass, a charger master plan. So we're, we're on board. Nice. And two fast chargers. I just saw this other one here. That's on there? Yeah, I do. Um, I had a question about... Uh, I, I'm thinking everybody in the room is probably aware that the FIS ski racers wrote a letter to the FIS asking for changes in how they schedule their races and, and the fact that so many races were canceled. I think some of the main requests they had were changing the beginning of the season a little later and ending it a little later to match snow conditions that already exist. And the other one was they were I think probably mostly the Americans were upset that they had to fly across the Atlantic twice to attend races over here. Is there an opportunity for the ski company to work with the FIS and try to address some of the, these concerns and maybe bring the city along with you to, uh, I mean, we're all the, I, I really see the ski industry as being at the forefront of, of trying to educate the public, really, because we do see the immediate impacts of climate change. And so I'd like to see if there are opportunities to collaborate on working with the FIS to address these concerns that ski racers have, which are concerns that actually we all have. Yeah, John, I, I mean, uh, Rigney can speak to this a little more, but I, I think that's important. The requests by the skiers were operational, the things you described. I'm interested in the FIS, you know, moving uh, politically and from an advocacy perspective on climate. A couple of years ago, the head of the FAS was denying climate science. Exactly. So that really concerns me. The big win is that. And then, sure, you know, the ski team, we're working with Sophie, who's really interested in this. Uh, that group can pressure the FIS. And then John has a closer relationship than I do with them. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> one of the solutions is relatively simple. They brought both speed to one location and tech to another location. So the whole squad came here and, you know, one got two races and one got three, but at the end of the day, you know, speed, speed, tech, tech, that might be a way to cut the kind of the, the burden of travel in half. Um, I think to your point about like, we're one of the few venues that does have snow early season. Um, so we've always said like, look, we're there for you. If you get in a jam, you know, you gotta cancel a race, we'll listen. Um, but I, I go back to my earlier point, like we really do think that racing if, if we're to grow love of ski, you know, skiing and, and ski racing, it's got to be shown in a, 
you know, in March. And I honestly think if I'd brought up the idea of doing races in March, 10 years ago, that would have been a little bit of a tough sell. You know, March was everything. Yep. And now we kind of open our eyes with 2017. So being, I think being flexible is one of our greatest strengths from Aspen Skiing Company to work with these guys. Yeah. Um, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to have the snow. So we, we will wade into those conversations any and every day. We're welcoming them. We are blessed with high altitude. Yep. Okay, so, Jeff, if you've, right. have you been iced enough? You I've been to iced. <laughs> yeah, I've been totally iced. Thank you uh, very much for uh, welcoming me. Uh, it, it has been a very warm welcome to the community, and I know it's kind of now strung out over uh, a stretch of time, and I've been back and forth uh, to Canada, where I'm coming from, and so I just I really appreciate the, the opportunity to... Uh, to show up and, and share a little bit about myself, share a little bit of perspective on where I think uh, uh, I want to focus as, as, as I get started here. Um, but first and foremost, I, I'm also brand new with, with a couple of you. So Sam and Bill, congratulations, and, um, and I, I, others that won election but uh, have a, a storied past, I also congratulations. Um, I look forward to building strong relationships with you. I'm a connection person. I'm somebody that, uh, I've, I, aside from when I was at the University of Colorado, never not lived in a, in a, in a mountain town. Uh, the mountains are uh, pretty much everything to me. And uh, I'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, I, I value the opportunity to partner with you to talk, to listen, and to try and make uh, Aspen as great as we can make it. And, you know, the question back and forth today is something that uh, inspires me. You know, how can we make it better? If we show up every day and ask that question, I think we, uh, we actually together can make something better. Um, and being curious about, you know, what, what could be possible. Uh, so I'm extremely excited about that and uh, look forward to working with all of you. Um, so who am I? I'm a Colorado kid. I grew up in Winter Park, Colorado. And uh, yeah, maybe one of the few Middle Park High School graduates that's, that, that it now gets the opportunity to come back and kick around uh, in my home state after being gone for a long time. Uh, and yeah, no stranger to, to the ski business. I, I don't think I've uh, ever spent a winter except for maybe my first uh, where I haven't been on snow. So this is, a, it's an important thing to me. Um, my career journey uh, started in Winter Park. I was a ski racer, uh, and it took me to the University of Colorado, where I continued to be a ski racer, um, and happened to study finance on the on the rare occasion, uh, because skiing was was the most important thing to me. And uh, upon graduating, I promptly got offered a role in Park City, Utah, and uh, I've had the the honor to. Actually, was that, that's the longest stint that, um, that I've been. So I spent 15 years in Park City, Utah, and then have had the pleasure of uh, both uh, experiencing big and small resorts along the way since then. And so uh, had a stint in the Midwest where I actually saw, uh, I, I managed a portfolio of three resorts. I saw the passion for skiing. Uh, John mentioned it around NASTAR. Uh, in a way that I never thought I would. Um, we're talking night, freezing rain, jeans, rear entry boots, uh, and people having the time of their lives. And I was like, wow, what we do is aspirational to people, and they do it on far less of a, of a canvas than what we, we actually get the opportunity to do it on. And so that inspired me. Um, I had the opportunity to come back for another short stint in Colorado uh, where I was over at, in Summit County at Keystone for two years, and most recently spent the last four years in Whistler Black Home in British Columbia. Um, so I've seen the small resorts, uh, the big ones, um, and I've, uh, I've skied everywhere I possibly can, and uh, I love it, and it's what I'm all about. Uh, I think... I think about things, right? I think about how often... I've, I'm now carrying two phones around, not by choice. Uh, one's... Uh, a Canadian number that I need to kind of maintain as I until I'm completely uh, free and clear from the, from from there. Um, I travel a lot, and a lot of people look at their screens all the time. I mean, we all do. I, I'm I'm guilty of it. And 
the thing I love about what we do is people don't do that as much. They're focused on the mountains. They're focused on uh, the trees, the sounds, what they're feeling. And I think that's what we do. That's what I want to do. That's the business I want to be in. Um, so I'm a skier. Uh, I, I was raised by skiers, and I'm raising skiers uh, as well with, uh, with two children, 16 and 13, soon to be Aspen uh, Roaring Fork Valley residents. Um, so as I come in on the business side, my initial goal here is, uh, is really focused on continuity. Um, to listen, to learn. I've got a lot to learn. Uh, I'm not trying to change the course. Uh, I'm not trying to offer influence and vision or to take this the Aspen Skiing Company in a direction uh, different than what it's been on. Uh, I don't want to waver from the path uh, because I've, I've got such admiration for uh, what this community and the ski company has done and certainly the, the person to my right. Um, but before I do that, you know, I d I'm, I'm recently coming from, from Whistler Blackcomb. And while I was there, I, I had the privilege to spend four seasons uh, in Canada and uh, had the opportunity to operate uh, a, a resort on the traditional unceded territory of the, Squ uh, the Squamish Nation and the Little Watt Nation the local First Nations uh, in, in British Columbia. And we partnered with them in, in a way that uh, was unlike anywhere I had ever been, and I learned a lot. And one of the things that they, they taught me was the value and the, the, um, the value and the pa and patience in listening and learning. Um, to, to listen more than you talk, uh, to take the long view. These are a lot of things that I've heard from this company, but uh, as I've joined Aspen Ski Company, but uh, listening and learning has been a, a new go-to move for me. And uh, I recognize that um, it's, it's probably the most important thing that I can do as we all start to partner together. Um, so I come in uh, supporting the path we're on, not wavering from that, but also willing to learn uh, at every step. And I look forward to, to doing that with each of you. Um, but also in the spirit of listening and learning, I'm also here uh, and honored to be here in, the, in Aspen, in the Roaring Fork Valley, on the traditional ancestral territory of the Ute Nation. Um, they have had uh, an amazing stewardship, and, and we can listen and learn uh, in a lot of the topics that we've touched on today about how to care for the land and, the, and sustainability and the environment, and things from people that have been here long, long, long before we have. Um, and so I'm uh, more than willing, and I will stand up and say that I look forward to listening and learning as I integrate into this community. Um, so I appreciate the, the patience with me, but also, um, yeah, you know, you may have to talk me through something because I don't know it. Um, I've been inspired by the Aspen Skiing Company uh, for a long time. Uh, as a casual observer from the outside, um, I've been inspired by Mike and his impact. Uh, and his leadership, his willingness to take a stand on, on issues that are, uh, would be easy to take a pass on. Um, and I'm inspired by a lot of the leaders that have even came before Mike and uh, in our industry. Uh, you can go back to the first Roach Cup. Uh, how many years ago was that? 70 something? 36, I, something yeah. like that. Uh, the, the winner of the first Roach Cup uh, grew up in Hot Sulphur Springs, which is where my dad grew up. And as I took this job, my dad kind of brought that to my attention. He <laughs> said, uh, he said, I think the first winner uh, was jumping on the jumps in Hot Sulphur Springs. My dad wasn't even alive at the time, probably my grandfather, uh, who was running a gas station in Hot Sulphur Springs. So, um, yeah, I mean, the impact uh, of, of, this, uh, of this company and on, in this town and on this industry, certainly as it's changed, is, is something that I'm, I'm extremely inspired by. And I'm also inspired by the team that I get to work with every day now, uh, some of the most professional, passionate, caring people that, uh, that I've met in, in my years working in the industry. So looking forward to that. Um, as a leader, I, I anticipate that I will stay squarely focused on creating a premium, sustainable, transformative experience in nature, with recreation and culture at the best ski resort in the world. Uh, not only for our guests, but for our employees and for our community. 
I think that's important. This is, this is something that's for everybody. I'll stay focused on sustainability and climate. I'll stay focused on community and events. Uh, my vivid as day memory from my first World Cup in Aspen, not racing, uh, attending as a teenager, was getting Alberto Tamba's autograph on my baseball cap after he smashed the gates on the GS member when he started doing the, you know, he was skiing it different than everyone else was. Uh, I, I, I skied with that hat for, for years in slalom because it just, I, I felt it. Um, yeah, so I'll stay focused on, on, on events and community. I will prioritize inclusion. This is very important to me. I think I will be welcome and celebrate the uniqueness of individuals who are our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends, our guests, and our community. Uh, however they choose to live their life, uh, we'll celebrate that and support that. Um, as I look to partnering with you, I want to be a great partner, a good listener, somebody that can bring action to the table, uh, hopefully to the level that the people I'm sitting with uh, today are. Um, to work together on the most important, and as I understand it, uh, the most important are things that we've talked about. Housing, seasonal housing, employee housing, how do we continue to, to move the dial there? Traffic, the entrance to town, mass transit, getting people on transit routes, riding buses so that they're not driving individual cars. Hope that we can all work together on a lot of those things. Um, I recognize that I'm standing on top of a, of a pretty proven track record uh, of the people before me. And I am very well aware that I'm not local um, yet. I hope to be here for quite a while. Uh, I appreciate what this place is. Um, I think there's so much that I don't know, but what I do know is Aspen is special. It's distinct and unique, and it, you can feel the mountain culture here. You can feel the unique vibe. And as I mentioned, I've been in a lot of places. Uh, I've worked at a lot of ski resorts, and um, those places are special in their own right. But I would close by saying there is only one Aspen, and I'm honored to be here. So thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Nice to meet you. <laughs> thank you for your history there. That uh, uh, helps us all know a little bit about where you've been, and you've been just about everywhere. Um, I would just, uh, before I open it up to anybody else's comments or questions, um, I would just extend the invitation to you. Because you've been so many places and so many uh, wonderful destinations uh, that are similar to us that, uh, you know, I am completely open to contact anytime, any way. Uh, and you can probably share some great ideas that you're bringing from other places. Absolutely. Not just on the hill, but also in town. So. Um, We'll have more opportunity to connect as you get settled Love in. That. When are you actually relocating to the valley? That's a co complicated question. I'm basically, uh, now my heartbeat is here. Yeah. And as of, what, a couple hours ago, when I, I landed uh, this a earlier this afternoon. Um, fin I wanted to finish out the ski season, uh, not finish out the ski season for me, but my, my son was racing in... Uh, the provincial championships and the Whistler Cup, and uh, I wanted to be there for him for that. Um, so as of today, I'm now here. Uh, probably have another six weeks of uh, back and forth. I'm going to try and get my son here. He tends to kind of roll with his dad, and my wife and daughter kind of follow behind. Usually, is what happens. Um, but he, yeah, hopefully, he'll start school here in the in the, in the last uh, last month of uh, of this school year and be ready to go next year. Wow! Wow! So I'm going to go back up in two weeks, grab him, and, and toss him in. Right on. I mean, yeah. uh, I, I wasn't by any means uh, trying to hurry that process at all. <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm trying to hurry it. I'm anxious. Well, I'm anxious. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, but, uh, but nonetheless, welcome to Aspen. Thank you. Um, most important to me is that you have a wonderful time here. Um, we all work hard. We all work hard even to be here and enjoy it sometimes. Uh, but more than anything, number one priority is... Uh, uh, recreation, enjoyment, and quality of life. So I hope that that is really a focus for you as well, and I hope it's successful. And I'm available to you anytime, any questions or any help you need, I'm here for you. So Thank you. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll open it up. I'll, I'll start down with Sam. Um, welcome, Jeff. It's, it's wonderful to sit here and, uh, you know, on my second meeting, welcome you to Aspen and the way that I was welcome. Um, 
I, it sounds like you have the great attitude and like perspective on Aspen and everything. And the only thing I really would add is just like Mike, you'd see Mike out on the hill all the time. I hope we see you out on the hill all the time and you're just like a face in this community that's not behind a desk all the time and that we really, really see you and you get to embrace this community. I think we'll be good. Yeah, I you thought so. about that. He's, oh, he usually has ski pants on under yeah. when he's at his desk. I so. don't wear them on the airplane. I thought so. What's, your, <laughs> no, right. what's gonna be your identifying uh, outfit? Oh, uh, you know, look, uh, I told the Crowns when, when we were talking about coming to take this job that um, a huge piece of it for me was I want to live in a place where I can wear ski pants for the rest of my life every single day. Perfect. I mean, maybe not in the wintertime, but uh, yeah, no, I, I'll be out there. And, uh, you know, like I said, it's, uh, um, yeah, it's what, it's what matters to me. And so I'm willing to work as hard as I, as hard as I possibly can uh, so I can be out there. And I know I've, I've got a, um, you know, high bar to, to reach with, uh, with this gentleman. But, um, yeah, that's, what I, that's why I'm here. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Ward? Welcome. Thank uh, you. Looking forward to uh, continued partnerships with the ski company and the city. Um, <laughs> I couldn't help but chuckle at the Midwest because when I moved here in 76, I thought I was really good when I had uh, two cans of uh, Scotch card in my blue jeans. And <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's <laughs> night skiing, cold skiing back in Minnesota, but uh, it, it, it seems to be, it doesn't matter where you get your love for the sport, um, when you come to Aspen, it just blossoms. So yeah. um, I welcome you and always open. Thank you. Thanks, Ward. John? Yeah, just really quick, I want to go back to World Cup racing um, and talk about the access that, that we have to our the athletes that are our heroes. Uh, I talked to a lot of people that week, and it's like, in football, you don't have access to those people or baseball. So that's a really special part of our sport. And I really appreciate the fact that we have these racers come here and we can interact with them. That's, that's big for me. And I know it's big for most people in this town. Um, I do want to say, Mike, you will be missed. Uh, you're leaving some huge shoes to fill. And I think your steady hand has benefited the ski company and this community. Uh, your letter to the community a couple of years ago about inclusiveness moved me, and um, you, we're going to miss you. Jeff, welcome. You said some things that uh, make me think that you're an incredible fit. So I look forward to spending some more time with you. Thank you, John. Good Thank you, you, John. I appreciate that. Thanks, John. Uh, Bill, I'm going to just ask you if you've got any uh, comments or questions at this time. No, just a... Uh, Hi, Jeff. Nice to meet you. Excited to have you here. Thanks. And thanks, Mike, for all you've done. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Bill. Yep. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon. Yeah. Yeah. You will. Thank you. As Thank we you. say, nice see you on campus. Thank you. See you out at Aspen Mountain this week. Yeah. 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 One more party. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was up there today. I'm going to try to hit it every day I can. Wednesday will not happen because we have some other meetings to attend, but yeah. In between days, I think. So. Yep. Thank you, guys. Have a great one. Auden, thanks for being here. Michael, thank you for coming. Hi, Auden. And we're overdue, Michael. Um, all right, I want to thank you so much. Uh, right now, uh, our second item on our agenda for City Council is uh, board reports and um, uh, council updates. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and start with you, Bill. I don't know if you have any uh, updates or any items that you wanted to use this time to uh, talk about, but uh, that's what this, th this is an opportunity for. I'll, uh, I'll listen to what's going on from others first, but thank you. All right, uh, let's start with board reports. I have no board reports. I will be going to Accra, Nordic Council, and my first option meeting on Wednesday. Super excited. You have, you have Accra, APCHA, and Nordic Council this week? Wednesday. All Wednesdays, all Wednesday. Trifecta. Okay, trifecta, rock on. Uh, any board reports, Ward? 
yeah, it's with uh, reluctance or um, as I, I rotate off a of raft uh, and core, um, the, the energy I put into it and uh, the relationships I've built with the, the different members has been, um, it, it's really been a, a, a positive aspect for my time here at the city council. I, I see that I have uh, email to uh, be on the subcommittee, uh, the third meeting, uh, our fourth meeting for the subcommittee on RAFTA to set the retreat agenda. Um, so I'm, I'm still have one foot in, but one foot out, and uh, really encourage Sam to attend the, the, the core and the uh, RAFTA meetings as a full participant. Uh, although you're alternate, it's really important that you you attend those meetings and become um, a part of the organization. Um, so I, um, I'm moving on, <laughs> handing off, and uh, looking forward to the first meeting of, I, I'm, I, I only have two meetings, uh, well, I, I guess I have four on Wednesday, but <laughs> at the Akron and Apsha meetings. Uh, then uh, we're meeting with uh, Matthew, I think, and then have a, uh, an APSHA meeting and our APSHA meeting. <laughs> Keeping APSHA and APSHA straight is difficult sometimes, but yeah, so boards are so important and um, really encourage Bill and Sam to um, get involved in those areas. Right on. Thanks, Ward. Uh, board reports for me, I, I did attend RAFTA uh, last Thursday. I sent the agenda to other council members um, except Bill I don't think I copied you in on the RAFTA agenda um, no big deal I'll send it to you if you like but uh, basically you know from an executive session that started it off that was talking about uh, different legal advice for some employee housing issues uh, to personnel matters of succession planning for our leadership at RAFTA was what the uh, content was of the meetings uh, our consent uh, agenda was appointing members to the Mid-Valley Trails Committee. Uh, we went over the raft of climate action plan. Um, these guys, uh, we, we set them off to start looking at ways for raft to improve its uh, carbon footprint in all areas of operations. And so we just got back kind of uh, the preliminary uh, look into where we we're going to be effective there. It was a really great report. It is also available in the notes that are provided. Um, the update regarding 27th Street pedestrian underpass, of course, that's um, down in Glenwood, but RAFTA is a partner in the, in the overall project. Uh, things are moving forward there. It will start uh, construction here in the next two months. Uh, our public hearings were uh, some revisions to the Rio Grande Corridor Access Control Plan. Um, and then we just went over, uh, as you are saying, we have the board retreat, which is coming up. Uh, May, June, um, where did I just write it down? Uh, soon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ward is actually still participating in getting that ready. And then also what's always very interesting from our uh, raft of meetings is that included in the packet is the CEO report from Dan Blankenship. Uh, and so there's some good updates and information in there. That was RAFTA, and that was uh, last Thursday. We meet on the uh, second Thursday morning of every month. Um, other than that, I had to update. Yes, I have got, uh, I will be attending the ACRA meeting as well, and uh, I wanted to update everybody on CAST, Colorado Association of Ski Towns, and what's been going on there. We've spent a lot of time with our energy and attention on uh, House Bill, 213 mm -hmm. or state senate bill 213 it's house i think it's house two senate 213. it's sb sb so sb 213 uh and we are it's supposed to go back to committee tomorrow we have been participating with the governor's office and trying to do some uh constructive writing of some of the land use uh, uh implications and impacts that they're having there basically We'll know more tomorrow. We are we're we're not we're not comfortable still with what's going on with two thirteen. 
there's another housing bill that's moving through, uh, well, not necessarily just housing, but growth management, which is 1255. Um, and CAST, because of our attention on 213, really just stepped up to start talking about 1255 about last week. So uh, we are in an opposed position on 1255 as well. It'll have a lot of impacts for how we do business in Aspen. Um, that's all for board reports. So, with that, council updates, other items that you want to talk about? Uh, so, I emailed this morning and got the boards and commissions when they meet, who's the person, who's the alternate. Um, you know, you live, you learn, you should know this information going into the first meeting, but this would have been incredibly helpful because um, I'd like to make it known rather than getting chastised and maligned for not being on certain boards and commissions. Um, it is an adjustment no matter how much you know the commitment the city council is. So taking steps in the right direction to try to do as best I can. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Sam. Bill, any, uh, any other items you wanted to bring up at today's meeting? Yeah, if, if you're interested and, and supportive of my idea about free raft the trips that originate or terminate in Aspen, um, I would ask to see if you could get some information from them uh, in your work on that board, which I appreciate. Uh, namely, what would it cost in terms of an annual subsidy from the city of Aspen to, to make that idea a reality? And what, what kind of techniques, like, I, I guess, do they, do they feel there's a way to implement that, that strategy, right? Like, so how do you figure out who's getting off in Aspen and therefore don't charge them? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of scenarios there, but do, do they think it, it could be a reality? So again, if you're interested in pursuing that, I would appreciate hearing that from the RAFT board and leadership. Mr. Mayor, if a majority of council supports that, we could take that on as staff. Doing doing that legwork, if you'd like. I know RAFT has Your been call, if you want to do it, all good. RAFT has been talking about this for over a year. Um, and I think that it was, uh, there was a study done in Utah, Tori, that had increased ridership by something like 16%, if I recall. And um, the challenge that we've had at RAFTA is that we don't have enough drivers to make it a, an attractive alternative. That um, if, if you look at the BRT cancellations every day, there are several routes every day that are canceled. Um, and when at, coming out of COVID, when we were talking about this at RAFT, I think it, it's going to fluctuate a little bit, but it was something like uh, 6 or 8% of RAFTA's revenues come from fares. So it's not a huge burden to find a way to finance this. It, it would be a loss of revenue. But um, I know that the RAFTA board has been interested in um, a fare-free uh, valley uh, for a number of years. and. Um, it, 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 again, like with the ski co and everything else, it comes down to housing. If you can't get enough drivers, um, you offer free um, bus or fare free. Not, buses are not free, but fare free. Um, it, you, you have to be able to offer um, a product that is uh, attractive, and the problem has been can't get enough drivers. Yeah, I, I understand that, uh, um, and I appreciate that perspective, Ward. But I, I just want the isolated information about what what would it cost and how can it be done, and then we can sort of tackle the reasons why it can't be done and work through those later. But uh, I, I'd like some real information, personal, on can it be done? What does it cost to do it? Yeah, right. Um, okay, we'll, we'll get some info for you. Thank you. It's not. It's that's. It's not dig. Uh, it's not deep digging, um, and and it comes up every once in a while. So we'll be able to get that. Um, thanks, Bill. Anything else? No, thank you. All right, great. All right, uh, we can call it an evening. It's an evening. Good job, Ward. We want to say thank you to Grassroots. Uh, we are not having a work session tomorrow evening, the 18th. We will be back. For your viewing pleasure on uh, the 
the, the fourth, the twenty fourth, next Monday, March, April. The march to the cup begins tonight. For the Avs, it starts tomorrow night. Have a great evening, everybody. Thanks, Bill. Enjoy your time.